You're almost done. Praise the Lord, huh? You've worked hard. Done a good job. Okay. Module 15, we're looking now, still in plant A, but now we're looking at plant physiology and reproduction. And he tells us here, remember the anatomy was studying, like identifying the structures. Physiology is actually the life processes themselves. It's actually the day-to-day -day functions of the plant. We all know plants need water. Anybody that's ever gone home and not watered their plant knows they die, don't they? And so he gives us four different reasons that plants need water. Um, and he lists them there. He tells us they use them for photosynthesis, turgor pressure, hydrolysis, and transporting different nutrients around. But let's go ahead and look at that uh, a little more closely. If you'll remember, when we, way back when we memorized photosynthesis, we said that the roots sucked up the water, that the plant inhaled carbon dioxide, and then it made glucose and exhaled oxygen. And we put sixes on everybody but the glucose, which already had its six. Remember that? And um, so this is one of the places the plant needs water. But it's very important, the book points out, that plants only actually get their water from the roots. They don't get them from the leaves. A lot of people think if you water the leaves, they'll, you know, they spray them with little spray bottles and stuff. And it does help the overall uh, plant. It makes it look prettier too because it's wet. <laughs> but the plant actually needs the water in the roots to absorb um, the water. What else does the plant need to absorb in the roots that it talked about? Oxygen. Oxygen, thank you. If the plant's roots are underwater all the time and they are not designed to be underwater all the time, then the plant doesn't get the oxygen that it needs in the roots and it can die. Now, I don't, a lot of people don't think about plants needing oxygen, but the reason that the plants are making the glucose is so that they can go through cellular respiration, aerobic cellular respiration, to make ATPs, just like us. So they still need oxygen, even though they actually kind of use both, don't they? The carbon dioxide and the oxygen. So I'm not exactly sure how hydroponic farming fits into this, but hydroponic uh, gardening is where you actually grow plants in water with the nutrients in the water. So I can only guess that they still allow a certain amount of the root to be outside of the water so that it can gather oxygen. Also, once again, your trees that are made to live in the water, like mangroves, like cypress trees, they actually have specifically designed structures to help the roots breathe. They think that the cypress knees help the uh, roots on the cypress tree to breathe. Um, if you've ever been near a mangrove, you've seen the roots are very much like this and they're not all underwater, so they have areas where they can breathe. Black mangroves actually have pneumatophores, which look like pencils sticking up from the roots, for them to breathe. And so all these roots apparently have a need to breathe. Um, you can like take a avocado seed and grow it in a glass of water, but eventually when the tree gets going, you need to actually take it out and plant it, otherwise it will die if you leave it in the water too long. Been there, done that, I know this from experience. <laughs> so frequently I kill them once I put them in the dirt. I'm not exactly sure why. I'm just, I love plants, they just don't always like me. Anyway, um, so photosynthesis is very, very important to having the water so that it can actually photosynthesize with that it'll die. The next reason he told us was turgor pressure. And if you'll remember way back when we studied cell biology, we saw that plant cells had the central vacuole in the middle of the cell, and then they had a cell wall around the outside, both of which are not found in animal cells, right? And so we saw that the, I told you guys to think of the cell wall kind of like a flimsy box and that the central vacuole would fill up with water, kind of like making a water balloon inside of our flimsy box so that our box would stand upright. Remember that? When there's not enough water and the water moves out of the central vacuole and it loses turgor pressure, the box bends. And when a plant bends, we call it what? Wilting, right? It wilts. And so that's why if your plant is wilting because you haven't watered it and you water it, the water moves back into the central vacuole and it stands back up. That's why we see that. Uh, that's also why if you over fertilize a plant, it'll kill it and it'll look wilted because it'll actually osmotically draw all the water out 
of the uh, centrovacuoles and it'll lose its trigger pressure and it dies. But it, it loses all the water at that point. It just literally sucks the water right out of the tissues of the plant. So don't over fertilize your plant, I guess is the lesson there. <laughs> My plants are lucky to ever see fertilizer, but anyway. Um, and then it mentions nastic movement. And so let's go ahead and John, would you read for us what he says nastic movement is, please? Plants response to a stimulus, just a st plants response to a stimulus st such that the direction of the response is programmed and not dependent of the direction of the stimulus. Thank you. <gasps> what did that mean? Okay, thank you very much. What they're talking about there, good example would be below that, he shows a picture of a mimosa. And this is a touch sensitive plant. And if you touch a mimosa, it will close its leaves up. And I've had some of you guys tell me that you've walked through a field of mimosa. I've had some students tell me that and watched them close behind you as you walk through it, which must be really weird. I have never dealt with these personally. They're fun, They're fun to touch. Okay, because they shut. And we're not used to plants that respond to our touch, are we? Now, if you touch them here, they close. If you touch them here, they close. If you touch them here, they close. They close the same way no matter where you touch them. That's why it's nastic movement. It's pre-programmed. It's not stimuli directed. It's not going to grab for your hand. Okay? It just closes. That's all it does. And so that is the pre-programmed movement that it's talking about. If it were directed towards stimuli like a plant that follows the sun, when I was in college, I liked African violets. Uh, they're the ones with the little furry leaves, and you see them in the grocery store. They have all the pretty violet-colored flowers, or they can have dark purple or light purple or white, but they're little tiny flowers, and they're in all the stores because they're a little plant. African violets. And I think they're pretty because all the little flowers, they don't like me, but I like them. And when I was in college, I had two of them on my shelf near my window, and there was a fishbowl in between. And I would come home every day, and the plant would be moved. And I figured my cat was getting up there to go fishing because that plant would be turned in a different direction than how I left it every day. And man, I got all over that cat. And then one day I was home studying, and that plant moved. It was following the sun across the bedroom window. And it literally, the leaves would change direction, and it looked like the plant was totally turned around because the plant's leaves were following the sun every day. Okay, that would not be nastic movement because it was actually stimuli directed as to where that plant was moving its leaves. I felt so badly. I had to make friends with my cat after that. Um, and he never did, that particular cat never did eat the fish. So obviously he wasn't up there like I thought he was. <laughs> but sunflowers will do that, won't they? They'll follow the sun. And so that's not nastic movement. That's actually stimuli driven movement. Nastic movement specifically will not go where the stimuli is. It'll be a pre-programmed movement. Okay, I'm pounding that because I don't know about you, but I found that confusing. So I was just trying to make it clear as I can what that is talking about. Okay, tropism is actually where it grows in a direction of a particular stimuli. Now, I'm telling you that those plants do this daily, but have you ever seen a plant that grew towards a window? I bet you have. And if a plant grows in a specific direction, particularly towards a window, that would be phototropism because the plant is actually growing towards the light. Um, and so we're going to talk more about that in, on the next page in just a minute. On page 465, we have hydrolysis. Remember, so, so far the water is used for photosynthesis and turgor pressure, and, and nastic movement would be, you know, under turgor pressure. Then the third one is hydrolysis, and I know this is going way back to the biochemistry chapter. Oh my goodness, it seems like years ago, right? But it's the idea that, remember, hydro lysis, we're cutting big molecules with using water to make smaller molecules. And plant cells make glucose, but then it's very efficient to store the glucose. It'll actually bind those little monosaccharides together into polysaccharides, which we call starch, and store them that way. And then when it's time, it needs to go through hydrolysis so that it can break it back down to glucose and use the individual pieces that it needs. And so the hydrolysis is important to the plant. And then the last one is the exact same reason why we need to drink a lot of water. 
transportation throughout the plant and in our bodies. Our blood transports the nutrients and the gas exchange and stuff that goes on in our body is in our blood and our blood is made up of mostly water. So it's very important that we drink enough water. It helps everything to work. And so the plant also needs water to transport, God bless you, things up in the xylem, things back down in the phloem, and so it's very important in that way. Uh, because of our lab, I'm going to skip the on-your-owns. If you have an on-your-own that you need me to um, say something about that you were you know, not real clear on, please stop me. Okay, raise your hand and I'll be happy to deal with that. The next thing we get into is water absorption. And we already talked about that they only absorb water basically through the roots, not the leaves. Uh, because of that, the soil composition is very, very important. And some soil, you guys have probably all seen soil that looks different depending on where you go. Here in South Florida, we have a lot of sand, don't we? And I always think about sand, and it's like mostly sand in a lot of places. If you ever drove your car into that white sugar sand and it got stuck, you know what I'm talking about. Um, that soil is very, very dry and it doesn't hold much water. And the reason is, is because it's got a lot of pore spaces, so the water absorbs into it and goes right through it and it's out the other side and it doesn't do very well as far as plants. So in those areas you don't see many plants at all. Um, the, so we have inorganic portions of the soil like gravel, sand, clay, and silt. And those are the ones that he lists there. And I didn't do them in the right order. The clay is actually larger than the silt. Um, the gravel's the largest, then there's the sand, then there's the, the silt, and then there's the clay. Is that right? Let me make sure I got it right. Yep. I always thought a silt is being smaller than clay, but apparently it's not, the particles in it. And that's, I guess, why clay is so slimy when it gets wet and it's so solid when it gets hard. So that makes sense. But anyway, um, so those are the inorganic portions. What's something that's organic that's found in soil? Yes? Dead plants. Okay, dead things, like pieces of dead things, bacteria, fungus, earthworms, um, crustaceans, not crustaceans, they'd be water critters, but other um, arthropods, okay? Um, yeah, because we're not underwater here, I'm sorry. And so, but we'd have bug type critters in there, right? Those would all be your organics. Now, the pore spaces in the soil is very important because, I don't know if you know this, but like orange trees like really sandy soil. They don't like that sugar sand, but they want soil that's got more sand than other types of trees. And that's why they grow well in Florida, because we have a lot of sandy area. Why? Because orange trees like it to absorb water quickly, but then they don't want the water to stand. They want the water to go right back out the other side very quickly, too. And so that's why you have a lot of citrus trees in Florida and in California, because of the, that type of soil. Um, so the larger the pore spaces, which would be that case, the faster the water is absorbed, but the faster the water also is removed from the soil. If the pore spaces are smaller, then it's slower for the water to get in, it's slower for the water to absorb, but it's also slower for the water to leave. And I don't know about you, but I have drowned plants before by just taking dirt from outside and throwing it in a pot and then putting a plant in it. And there weren't enough pore spaces, so when you wet them, it stays too wet and it rots the roots and they die. And this is why when you go buy potting soil at the store, how many of you have ever noticed that if you buy potting soil at the store, it's got those little white styrofoam BBs in it? Come on, give it up. How many of you have ever noticed it's got little white styrofoam BBs in it? Yeah. I used to look at that and think, what are they selling me anyway here? You know, I wanted to buy potting soil. I didn't want white BBs. And actually, that is to help with the pore spaces in the soil so that it actually holds the water for the right amount of time for most potted plants. So I was like, oh, hmm, maybe that's why I'm having trouble just grabbing it out of the yard and killing my plants, you know? So these pore spaces really do um, make a difference. They're determining how much water and air can get in around the roots, and it makes a huge difference in how the plants go. That's like certain plants have to have very specific soil. Uh, once again, those little African violets I liked, at the store you'll notice there are bags next to the other potting soil that say African violet soil. They have a separate need compared to other plants, and so they're handled, probably because they're from Africa, you know? So they've got different stuff. But 
very different. And then he tells us what loam is. And he tells us that loam is a mixture of gravel, sand, silt, clay, and organic material. He tells us that for most plants, the healthiest mixture, which would be loam, would be a little bit of gravel, 40% sand, 40% silt, and a little over 20% clay, and then the uh, organic matter, and that would give the ideal pore spaces. You do not have to memorize those numbers or anything. You do have to know that loam is made up of gravel, sand, uh, clay, and uh, silt and clay. Okay. Um, then we get to, on page 467, we're talking about water transport in the plants. And the reason that water moves through the plants <laughs> really is a mystery. Um, <laughs> in us, the reason the blood is able to flow to different parts of our body is because our heart is busy pumping it, isn't it? And that's why the blood gets to our head and comes back from our feet is because our heart is very busy pumping that blood around so it can go around. But did you ever stand at the bottom of a hundred foot tree and think how is it pulling the water up from these roots to those top branches? I mean, seriously, that's not the kind of question I've thought about. I'm a bad person. I don't think about those things when it comes to plants. I do think about it on some stuff. I, I Usually, I'm very critter-oriented. I usually look at the critters and try to figure things out, you know? But I never really thought about that one. How does the water get from the bottom of that pine tree to the top needles of that pine tree, 100 feet up? And water's not light, is it? You guys have all carried a gallon of water at some point in time, haven't you? Water is not light, and you get these bigger trees, and they got to get a lot of water up there. So they don't have a heart. So the question is, how do they get all that water that far up? And it's a really good question. Now the answer is, we're not really sure. <laughs> I love that answer. Anyway, <laughs> but we have a theory. And the theory is the cohesion, cohesion tension theory. And that's what's on page 467. And the idea is this. They say, so I'm, gonna, I'm not an artist, so please bear with me. This is supposed to be a leaf on a branch. This is a root of a tree. Okay, so far so good. That's just the one side of the tree. That's all we're looking at. The idea is this. Water has surface tension, it has cohesion, and he defines here cohesion as the phenomenon that occurs when individual molecules are so strongly attracted to each other they tend to stay together even when exposed to tension. Cohesion is when things hold together even when something's pushing against them. So far so good. So water tends to do that. Some of you have had water between your fingers before and gone like this and seen how the water holds on for a while, doesn't it? Right? We have too much time on our hands that we have done that, but we have done that, haven't we? We've also all been at the restaurant, got in trouble with our mothers for putting the straw into the glass, putting your thumb over it, getting it out, and putting it on the table and getting the little thing to look like a worm that's expanding, right? Okay, been there, done that. That's all because, oh, there's an individual in here that's never done that. Don't tell your mother I told you how. At the, co the cohesion of the water is why we're able to do those kind of things. It causes the capillary effect and all those other things. So water can do some pretty strange things, can it? Well, here what we see is that the water is being sucked up in the roots and it's being carried up in the xylem and it goes all the way to the leaf and then the leaf will open its stomata and because it's in contact with the air, transpiration will occur, which is evaporation from a plant. Remember that? So a water droplet will evaporate from the leaf through transpiration and what they're saying is that because of cohesion when this one comes out it pulls all these up behind it. Now how I think about that is like the straw. If we pull water up in a straw it works the same way doesn't it? Some of you may have done a siphon situation before. Maybe you've siphoned water out of a pool or a hot tub and you use a hose. I'm not going to gasoline, it's too painful. Uh, you sucked out the, suck some water into the hose, you put your thumb over it, you put it down lower and then it pulls, continues to pull the water out. That's that same idea, okay? So the cohesion tension theory is because of this siphoning type idea that it's actually pulling the water up from the roots and out through the leaves. Now once again, do we know that's what's happening? 
Not for sure. And it actually says here there's a small amount of data that con con contradicts this theory. So do we really know how the water gets up to the top of that tree? No, we really don't know. And remember the xylem is the tissue that dies, but let's be honest, does a straw have to be alive? No, it still works, doesn't it? You can still drink through it, so it's okay. Um, so that's this idea, and then he shows you here the water strider that can walk on water because of water's cohesion. And what is the little insect that we have here in South Florida that likes to walk on top of the water that we all see so many of? Mosquitoes! Yes, lovely! We have lots of those. Okay, um, so on page 468 he also tells us, so the water goes up in the xylem, we think, through the cohesion tension theory, that's how it goes up, the trick is coming down. Now you'd think the whole trick would be going up. How's it getting up to the top of that tree? Once it's up there, no problem. Let it come down with gravity. What's the big deal? Let me tell you what the big deal is. Those of you that took physical science, do you remember when you were tortured with the acceleration due to gravity? Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Sound familiar? And remember that it's 32 feet per second square is the acceleration due to gravity. For those that are into the metric system, 9.8 meters per second squared. The point is, that baby's coming down. And if it's coming down from 100 feet, it's got a few seconds to get going. And it's accelerating at 32 feet per second squared. So by the time it's come down, if it's allowed to free fall from the top of that tree and just go through the phloem, it's literally going to blow out the bottom of the root and cause an aneurysm of the root. Ah, you know what I'm saying? That's it. You're done. And so that wouldn't be good, would it? Nevertheless, all of the tissue in between would not be able to get the nutrient value that the leaf has bothered to do through the process of photosynthesis. So that's why the phloem has to remain alive. The phloem has to be living tissue because its job is to slow down the process of that stuff coming from the top of the plant as it's going down. And that process we call what? What do we call the process in the phloem? Thank you. Translocation. And it says here that translocation is a process that the organic materials go through the phloem. So what are we supposed to know? When we do xylem, we're supposed to know that that's the cohesion tension theory. Phloem, we call that translocation. Okay? And now you know why. So we don't end up with plant root aneurysms, right? Okay. Um, all right, let's go on to plant growth. On page 469 and 470, he talks about differing types of plant hormones. And actually, he defines hormones for us on page 469. Katie, will you just read what, how he defines hormones, please? Chemicals that circulate throughout the multicellular organism, regulating cellular processes by interacting with specifically targeted cells. Thank you. Oh, my goodness, though. You don't want to have to remember all that. And you guys all know that we have hormones, too. So hormones are just... Think of them as having to do with growth, cellular growth at targeted cells, okay? So they affect cell growth and they work on specific cells. However you want to say that, that's what you need to know about hormones. He lists here that plants have auxins, gibberellins, cytokinins, abscisic acid, ethylene, and fluorogen. Let's turn to page 470 and we'll, we'll talk about these a little bit. The three that you need to know that aux, auxins cause, and auxins are the first group of plant hormones that were ever discovered. They regulate the amount that the plant actually grows and elongates. He gives us phototropism, gravitropism, and thigmotropism. Now once again, tropism means it's growing in a direction of the stimuli. Okay? Photo, you should think immediately, light. Right? So phototropism means it grows towards the light. But I want to show you how these auxins work. Gravotropism means that it's growing away from the gravity. And if you've ever had a plant that's fallen over, it tends to grow up anyway, even if the pot is sideways, doesn't it? Or you've probably seen a tree. I've seen palm trees that whatever reason got bent over and then they grow up, don't they? Okay, you guys have seen trees like that. And so that's because of gravotropism. And then the last one there, thigmotropism, think touch. It's got to do with growing because of touch, thigmo touch, okay? Photolite, gravel gravity, thigmo, think touch. Now, let me show you how these auxins work. Let's say we're doing uh, a plant and we got a, a light over here. What happens is 
The auxins are destroyed by the light on this side of the plant, but they're not on this side, so this side outgrows this side, and it grows towards the light. Isn't that weird? I would have thought it was the other way, but it, it's, that's apparently how this happens. Gravotropism. What happens is the plant ends up on its side, and that causes the auxins to be come down here because of the gravity. And where the auxins are, the plant grows faster than the other side, and it grows back up towards the top. And then on thigmotropism, let's say you have a tomato plant or a vine that get, goes around a stick. What happens is wherever the plant touches the stick, the auxins are destroyed. So over here, there's still auxins, and it will curve around the stick. Because where it's touched, there's no auxins. And the other side, the auxins will be. So it will literally grow, outgrow it, and it will curve around it. Isn't that weird? So that's how auxins work in plants. Yes, sir? If you took like, a plant and you consistently moved it, like every day moved it just a little, could, with the sun, could you get it to grow in like a really weird shape, like a spiral or something? Jason's saying yes. They do with bonsai trees. They, they, do they use light with bonsai trees? I know they trim them, but I didn't know they used light too. I don't know. I, I don't know. They usually just do it because they can, they can move them as they shape them to right. shape them into patterns and stuff. Yes, and it's beautiful. And I know you can make trees grow in certain ways because have you ever seen the trees in the grocery store that are braided? Their trunks are braided. Have you ever seen those? Where they've actually, but they did I don't think they used light for that, so I can't speak on using light for that purpose, but I know you can make a plant, quote unquote, train it to, to go a certain way. Just as Jason was saying, with the bonsais, they do that, and they stunt them. So, uh, okay, and then he mentions here eti etiolation, and that's when a plant grows a long way to get to the light. It's kind of like a runner, and then floop, and then it grows over here. So you, you, that's like when a plant gets left in the garage after it's been cold and you forgot about it <laughs> or something like that, you know? Yes? If you do get like a plant, so day one it grows this way and it goes back and forth, will it start growing that way by itself without you turning it eventually? Like will it get used to the pattern of growing? Oh, no, yeah. no, 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 because remember, the auxins are destroyed on the side where the light is, and that's why the other side outgrows it. So, no, it won't just say, okay, we're just going to keep going back and forth. You're thinking like an animal, <laughs> and these are plants. They are really weird. You think they're weird now? Wait till you get to the next section we're going to go through next week. They really confuse me there. So, but thank you. I, I appreciate your thought process, because I think more like animals, too. Um, he mentions here gibberellins, and those, uh, he mentions on page 471, that promote stem elongation, um, and they induce seeds to generate. Then he mentions cytokinins, which affect the mitosis rates and cellular differentiation, um, and then it also helps with the synthesis of chlorophyll and leaf elongation. Number four, let's see, he gave us abscisic acid. These, uh, they're primarily are to inhibit the incision layer from closing, and they also control leaf stomata, so at least the abscission layer and abscisic acid sound somewhat alike. The ethylene is specifically used to ripen fruit, and um, it causes the abscission layer to close, and so uh, these are, ethylene is used industrially to ripen fruit that's been picked um, while it's still green, you know, so it's not ripe yet. And then fluorogen, they think, is a hormone used to control flowering in anthophytes, um, but they're not absolutely sure yet. But they think there must be one to do that, and they're trying to find it. And then he talks about how athletes shouldn't use steroids. Uh, they do because it promotes bulking up, but it also causes other dangers in people's bodies, which we know that to be true. Okay. On page 472, he introduces the idea of insectivorous plants. Now, insectivorous plants are plants that, God bless you, they basically digest insects. That's the name insectivorous, okay? They don't actually eat the insects because these are actually plants they photosynthesize for their food. But these plants are designed to live in soil that doesn't have enough of the nutrients in it that other soils have in it. Now he shows you there a picture of a um, Venus flytrap, but I want to show you one that I was amazed. I didn't know we had these here in Florida. This is a beautiful picture of a field in a seepage bog. A seepage bog is a place where the water comes out slowly from, out, from under the ground, and if you stepped on it, it would squish, okay? Because of that, 
the ground there is very lacking. It's very acidic and very lacking in nutrients. So normal plants can't grow there. These beautiful plants, which look like this, are insectivorous plants. They're called pitcher plants. And they actually come in some really pretty colors. And let's see if I can get you one other picture. Here we go. And this is showing you they've got these cool colors that draw in their, the insects so that the insect thinks he wants to come in and then he slides down in and he gets caught. And down inside the pitcher, if you could see this, and I know you can't, they cut them open and it's full of bugs. Full of bugs. There are actually some, there's a picture here with a little frog living here. He's living in there because he's catching the bugs that the pitcher plant provides. Is that cool? And so it's not just Venus flytraps. These pitcher plants are just totally beautiful. I've heard uh, that they found a pitcher plant in the Philippines that was big enough that it had a rat in it, a dead rat. So some of these uh, plants that are designed to find their nutrients in other places than the soil can get very large in certain places. But I wanted to show you those because they're pretty, aren't they? And I don't know about you, I mean, I see a Venus flytrap and I go, okay, that's cool, but it's not pretty. But I saw these pitcher plants, I'm going, they're beautiful, and they eat bugs. We all need them in our yards, you know? Here, eat my mosquitoes, right? Uh, so, yes? How do those ones digest them? Do they just sit there? They, they, no, they slide down. They apparently are very slick, and they slide down, and then all of them have certain chemicals that they use to digest them. And they're strictly doing it to absorb the, in, the, in this one's case, the nitrogen. And in these, once again, they're, they're designed by God to live in soil that other plants can't live in. And so because of the lack of that soil, they need the nutrients and they'll get it out of the bugs. If you fertilize a Venus flytrap, it will not grow the little fly-eating buds because it no longer needs to. And it's strictly a need situation that it does that. Okay? Yes? Uh, oh, yeah. If there's digestive juices all inside of the plant, how could the frog move there? He doesn't get down in. He gets right at the top and sits there. So the frog hangs out right at the top. I'll have to show you the picture after. He's so sitting right inside it. He'd die? If the frog slid down in there and couldn't get out, he would die. So the bugs can't get out, apparently. So, okay. Then on page 473, we're starting into reproduction, and he starts with vegetative reproduction. Vegetative reproduction is where it's basically a clone of the original parrot plant. We can get that through um, underground stems, which is like the potato. The eyes on the potato are actually where you could cut it off, and, and that's an underground stem. You could cut it off, put it in a pot, and it'll grow a new potato plant. I personally have tried that. I get them to where they make roots, and they make a beautiful little green thing, and then I put them in the dirt, and they die. Just plants and I don't seem to get along. My dad can grow anything, but they just don't like me. Um, and then also it mentions vegetative reproduction uh, using above-ground stems. And turn the page to page 474, that would be using runners. And it shows us that strawberry plants do that. And some of you may have seen that with uh, grass. If you've ever pulled grass up out of a place that doesn't belong and it goes poop, 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 and the runners come up. And that's how it grows different parts. So you can get them from above ground stems also, from regular stems. And then it mentions that some plants can grow a whole new plant from a leaf. There is a plant in this area called the, the plant of life. And it, it's got a leaf that kind of looks something like this. And this is a small plant. And I'm not an artist, so forgive me. But it's got a leaf that looks something like that. And if this leaf drops on the ground or if you put it in a bowl of water, every place there's a point will grow a whole new plant. Every place there's a point will grow a whole new plant. And that's why it's called the plant of life. It looks kind of like a cactus-y type plant uh, because of the, the, the texture of the leaf. But I can see where, so I think it's a succulent, but I can see where this plant would be a problem if you didn't want it loose in your yard. You dropped a few leaves, oh my gosh, and they start showing up everywhere, you know. So, but I've seen these as a potted plant. The other one is the African violet, the one I keep telling you about that I used to play with. The African violet, if you take one leaf and you put it in a bowl of water, just a little bit of water, it will actually grow a whole new African violet plant from that stem of that leaf. And I used to get it that far, and I could get little leaves, and I could get little roots, and then I put it in a pot, and it, bleh. anyway. Uh, <laughs> but you can do it. 
It has been done. So you can grow a whole nother plant from a leaf. And then the other thing is you can grow it from a stem. You guys are aware of that, that people will break off a piece of a plant and take it home and stick it in the ground and it'll grow a whole new plant. That's very cool and you can do that. Um, and so you can do it from uh, stems that way also. And then, and remember all of these vegetative forms are clones of the original plant. There's no new genetic combinations here. They're exactly the same as the parent plant. The one he mentions on 475 is good. It's called grafting. And grafting is where you actually take a piece of one plant and attach it to a, a different plant with different genetic makeup. They are supposed to be within kind so in other words, you wouldn't try to graft an apple branch to an avocado tree, okay? You would want to do apple branches to apple trees and citrus branches to citrus trees. So you would want to keep it within kind. Um, but you can, how this is used industrially, I guess that would be called, I should say agriculturally, is that if a farmer has an orchard and he has one tree that just makes spectacular apples, and he wants all his trees to have apples as good as that one tree, he'll go through and cut the branches off his other trees and take the branches from that one good tree and graft them onto his other trees. And that way he can genetically get all of his trees to produce those great apples. And see, the, the stock is already there, isn't it, that you're hooking it into. It's the Scion from the uh, good producer. Now, sometimes it's hard to graft a tree. Um, it's hard to graft off a piece of a tree. And so, uh, but when you do do it, they have to put it on and try to line up the xylem in the phloem. And then they'll put peat moss around it usually. Sometimes they'll put some hormones in there that you can buy at the store. And then they'll wrap it up in something like... Um, something that's waterproof so that it's kind of like a bandage so that it'll grow there. And he gives that the picture that is used here is that in the New Testament, the Bible says that Gentiles are grafted in to Israel because Israel was the original olive tree and that we're the wild olive tree and that we have been grafted in um, to the, the Israel so that we can benefit from the things that God has done for them. Okay, then we get to Anthophyta. So turn to page 476, please. Page 476. Flowering plants, if they have both the male and female parts, are called perfect flowers. If they only have the male part or they only have the female part, they are called imperfect flowers. Every flower that I saw when we did this experiment was a perfect flower. I just have to tell you that. I haven't seen any imperfect flowers. Some of you might have brought an imperfect flower, if so please show me because I'd like to see it. Okay? Now I'm going to use a lily up here because I don't have enough to give all of you and because they're so big and so obvious, it's really easy to see. First off, it... In your book, it shows that the stem of the flower is called the pedicel, and that holds the flower up. And then the bulge underneath the flower is called the receptacle. If it has the little leaves going up around the bottom of the flower, they're called sepals, and they actually enclose the flower when it's still a bud. And let me see if I can... Do I have any buds here to grab from? Yeah. Yeah, see, this, this one has a bud over here next to the gladiola, and so those would be the sepals. And you can see the sepals down around the bottom of the gladiola flower. Okay, so those would be your sepals. And then we get up to the flower proper, and we have the petals. And the petals have the pretty colors and smells because it actually helps different animals to come in and help them pollinate. And we're going to learn about that in the next reading. In this lab you're supposed to don't worry about drawing the flower in this form you're supposed to be drawing the parts so what you want to do is you'll take your flower and the next thing you're going to do is you're going to remove the sepals if it has it and then remove the petals and when you remove the petals you will expose the reproductive parts. So this is what I want you to do. And you students at home need to do this lab too. Everybody should do this. Everybody should have flowers available to them somewhere. Go to your local grocery store, ask for dead ones if nothing else. They're, they're very obliging if you tell them it's a science experiment. Okay, here we have the stamen, which is the male parts. And you see the stamen have the filament and the anther. See it? The filament and the anther. The anther is where the pollen is. Remember the pollen is the dust-like substance that has the sperm in it, and it also drives everybody crazy if you have hay fever, right? Okay. And so then, so these are the male parts, and this is what you should be drawing, okay, is this basic idea, and you would write lily. All right, and then you're going to remove 
these parts so that you have a good view of the next part. And in this case, the next part is the carpal, which is a female part. Your parents and I were taught the pistol, but apparently they're now calling it a carpal. And I don't know who sets these rules, so we're just going to let them go. At the top of the female part, at the top of the carpal, you have a trumpet-shaped stigma. And it's usually either furry, in the case of the uh, hibiscus that I brought you, it's kind of fuzzy. That's to catch the pollen. And then the style is the long part below the stigma where the pollen will travel to get down into the ovary. In this particular flower, I know that the ovary is in here because I dissected one at home looking for it down in here. And a lot of the flowers, it'll be down in here. But in this one, it's up in here. The next thing you do for your experiment is you will take your scalpel and you will very carefully cut through the ovary longwise and lay it open and find the ovary and find the ovules like they're pictured there in the book. Um, on the larger flowers, this will be very easy. You will be able to do all of these things. On roses, when you open up your rose, who's got a rose close by? There's one, thank you. On your rose, when you open up your rose, you're not going to be able to do that because every one of these is a male part and every one of these is a female part. So you'll be able to identify the stamen and you'll be able to identify the carpal, but you will not be able to dissect the ovary. It's too small. It's just too small. The other thing that he asked you to do was he asked you to find a composite flower, which I put some near each of you. Our composite flowers are extremely wilted here. But when you get these kind of flowers like sunflowers and daisies, that they have this fuzzy metal, every one of the pieces in this fuzzy metal is an individual flower. And, and I gave each of you one of these little tiny flowers to look at. If you will look at them under the magnifying glass, you will see that they have the, the carpal, and they have the stamen in each one of those pieces. Each one is an individual flower, okay? So what you're to do here is each of you are to, I, you do each flower, everybody needs to do at least six flowers. Um, you're gonna find all the reproductive parts, sketch them briefly. You can identify them when you get home if you want to. Make sure you cut open the ovaries and see the um, ovules inside the ovaries. Hold still. What you're going to do for next week is you're going to finish the chapter. You're going to finish the study guide. Don't take the test. Finish the chapter. Finish the study guide. And we'll go over that next week. Okay, and then after next week's class, you'll take the test. Yes, sir? Can you go over the on your own problem? 1510? Sure. 1510. Great. On 1510, it says, is there any way a plant that, reprodu that produces imperfect flowers can sexually reproduce with itself? Why or why not? See, my initial response was no. Yeah. But if you read his answer, he says yes, because some plants will actually have male flowers and female flowers on the same plant. And if that's the case, then the pollen can get from the one flower to the other within the same plant and pollinate it. But I went with no immediately too because I was thinking in those terms too, but apparently you can if it has male and female flowers on the same plant. That's a very good question, Josh. I did the same thing. Okay. All right, you guys, so you're going to do your lab and then have a Jesus-filled week. Okay, this is experiment 15-1 and we have flower anatomy and we're told to take a variety of flowers um, and these aren't all fresh to be sure and that we're to look at their parts, and the parts are listed on page 479, we're going to look at the pedicel, the receptacle, sepals, petals, stamen, filter, anther, pollen grains, carpal stigma style, ovary, and ovules. And we are also to choose a composite flower, um, like a daisy or a sunflower, where we can see that it's made up of hundreds of individual flowers. Um, and then we're supposed to scrape the pollen and look at it. Um, I have done this and I've, I haven't been able to get any as dramatic as what I could find for you online, so I will include those uh, pictures that I found online for you of uh, pollen. The first one I have here, as you can see, are roses. These are roses, and that's what we're going to look at. The reason I'm showing you this one is because as I was tugging on the rose, it actually dismantled itself for me. And you're, you're told in your lab to go ahead and pull the petals off, and I mean, they literally just came off in a clump 
for me. There's the, what was the rows. Okay, and so here, if you'll look as I separate, first we're supposed to see the pedestal, okay, the receptacle. These were the sepals because this used to be up around here. So these are the sepals. These are our petals. And um, then in here, these are anthers on the top. And you can see the filament in the anther. There, it just came off on my finger. So that's where the pollen would be. And then there's a bunch of them, as you can see. And then as you get in here, these are actually the... Um, carpels and there's multiple carpels and on the top of the carpel is the stigma and so here's your trumpet st shaped stigma and then the style going down so now let's go ahead and I'm going to put this on my pad and we're going to cut it open now this one thus the name flower dissection <laughs> okay, I'm going to hold it back up for you again Here's the trumpet shaped portion at the top of the sepal called the stigma and then it goes down in the style and then it would go down into the ovary would be down in here and the ovule which we're not going to see on this smaller one. So the rose is actually made up of a whole bunch. Each rose has a whole bunch of male and female parts, a whole bunch of um, stamen and a whole bunch of carpels make up each rose which is amazing when you think about it. Okay, let's go on and look at another flower. Okay. Okay, this is the interior of the rose on, at uh, 10 power. And I just wanted you to see, this is uh, where the ovules should be. Um, I'm just going to try to move this so you can see what we're dealing with here. See, there's the tops of them. There's the tops. Can you see the trumpet-shaped uh, stigma and style? And as you go down, that's where we ripped it in half. And then if you go over to the edge of the flower, over uh, here, you see the male parts. Let me try to focus in on that for you. There you go. You see the, the uh, anther and the filament. So you can see how it's made up of a whole bunch of those inside the interior of the rose. Try to get it back in your field of view. There you go. Amazing that that's in a rose, isn't it? This next flower I have is a gladiola, which comes uh, from a bulb, actually, and there's a whole group of these. They're beautiful flowers. You've probably seen them in the grocery store before. So. Here we would find the receptacle underneath and the sepals and the petty pedicel. And so we'll pull off the sepals. Okay, so we can see down here the receptacle. And so we're going to do like he says and we're going to strip off these beautiful petals. And as we strip away these petals, then the reproductive parts become very obvious. Here are the stamen, which is the male part. There's your filament and your anther, and there's three of them in the gladiola, apparently. Stigma, and then the style that the pollen would go down. And then if we go ahead and open this up, down here, What we see down here is the ovule, and there is the, um, the ovary, and there's the ovule. And actually, you can see it on both sides. You can see the ovary where the uh, female part goes down into. There's the ovary and the ovules. This is a hibiscus flower. And here you see the pedicel where it's attached. Underneath here you see the receptacle, which is the bulge. Here you see the sepals. And then we're going to pull off the petals. There's a lot of petals after these kind of labs. You can have a lot of fun with that. And we pull off the petals. And when we pull off the petals, this is a lacy or hibiscus. The other ones, uh, the parts are actually more obvious because there's less petal involvement. Um, but here, we can get past these petals, and I'm going to pull them all off so that we can see. 
here you see these are the tiny male parts. Here are the stamen. You see the filament and the little yellow anther at the end. Here is a very large um, carpal with the trumpet shaped and actually furry at the edge stigma and then the style going down and on this one I'm going to go ahead first off I'm going to make this easy on myself and get rid of some of this but I want to go ahead because this tends to be rather dramatic on these if I can cut this open so that you could see there we go that's what we're looking for and I'm going to hold this up hopefully so that you can see it but here you can actually get a very good shot at the style going down into the ovary and then within the ovary, and my fingernails are full of flowers, within the ovary you can see the ovules in there and that's what we're looking for and the hibiscus just does it so nicely. The hibiscus is um, wind pollinated and that's why it sticks its uh, stigma up in the air so high because um, that way it can catch it by the wind. If you have pollen allergies, you want to be careful doing this at home, although I would suggest all of you do this experiment at home because everybody should be able to get flowers. Just ask your local store for some dead ones, tell them you need them for a science experiment. Um, here's the receptacle once again. I don't see sepals on this. This is a lily. Um, they're so pretty and they smell so good. I'm going to peel back uh, the petals and the lily's parts are so obvious. They're really great for this purpose. So are tulips. And so this is very obviously the male part. This would be the filament, this would be the anther, and these anthers are full of pollen. And then as we pull those away, and I'm going to remove those so we can be very clear, um, here we can see uh, a very prominently the stigma, um, and excuse me, the carpal with the stigma on the end, the trumpet-shaped stigma on the end, the style running down, and then we'll go ahead and Oh, that might be the ovary right there. I'm not sure. But we know it's... In, yep, there's the ovules. So that had to be the ovary. There it is right there. Okay. Let's go to the next one. This is a carnation. Here is the pedicel, the receptacle, the sepals. Okay, so we're going to move those so we can see. We're going to remove the, the petals, and you really should try to do that fairly carefully. If you're doing it at home, I would take your time, um, but you could take your time to do this at home. And when I do this, we expose the reproductive parts of the carnation. Here are the stamen, the male part. Here's your filament and your anther. And then if you pull these back, much bigger trumpet shape on its carpal. There's the trumpet shape. Doesn't have much of a style, does it? Because this actually is the stigma. And so not much of a style. So let's go ahead and I'm going to cut this and then show it to you. And so I'm going to open this up for the carnation. And here we go. So we see that that is the female part. And right there is the ovary and in there are the ovules. I'm going to hold this up for you and hopefully you're going to be able to see that. Where are those? Okay, I'm not sure what kind of flower this is, but it's pretty. <laughs> Looks like a little tiger lily to me, but I don't know. Anyway, once again we have the pedicel, the receptacle. Um, not sure on the sepals on this one. We're going to remove these petals, which are very pretty. And here we see the male parts. Here's your filament with your anthers. And then if we remove those so that we can really clarify, here we have the female part with the stigma and the style. Once again, it's a trumpet shaped stigma. We're going to go ahead and open that up. As we open that up, ooh, that's very obvious. I'm going to hold that up for you. That is a very obvious. Here's your, your uh, style going into your ovary, and you can see the ovules in there very nicely. And I, like I said, I'm not sure what, what kind of a lily type that is, but maybe some of your moms could look at it and tell.
Okay, here's another flower. It's a real pretty one. Maybe a sunflower. I'm not sure. One way or another, this is definitely a composite flower. That much I can tell you because, guys, every one of these is a whole flower. Each one of these individually, let me just show you here if I can. I'm going to break it apart. Each one of these individually has a, uh, inside of it, has the female and the male parts. So each one of these is a little tiny flower. Is that a trip? And so that would be a composite flower. And if you were able to open each of these, and I hope you'll do this at home. First off, can you see the, I'm going to hold it up. Can you see the little hairs on the side? Those are the male parts. Those are the stamen. And they have the filament and the anther. There's the female part. There is your carpal with your trumpet-shaped stigma and your style. And so each little interior piece of this is a whole separate little flower. That would be a composite flower. That's a really good example for us of a composite. So you see one here against my fingernail. There's the male parts on the side. There's the end of the female part with the trumpet shape going down in. Now this is obviously too small to try to cut open and find the ovary and such, but you could mark where it would be in your drawing. Thanks. All right, this is the actual little tiny flower we just looked at in the daisy, and I just put it under the dissecting microscope so that you can actually see this is the top, um, the, there's the style and the stigma, here are your um, anthers and your filaments, and so this is actually just, I'm going to try to push it up for you, this is actually just a little tiny flower. And like I said, that little tiny flower, it is, there's hundreds and hundreds of them that make up the center of that composite flower. So I just wanted to um, see if I can get it back in your field of view. I just wanted to show it to you once more so that you could get a good view of it. Let's see it under the dissect, you know, the uh, dissecting microscope.